Open it, open us up in prayer and we'll get into, into the, the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to hear your word, Lord God, to actually open up the Bible and read the scriptures and allow you to speak through the scriptures, Lord God. We know that, that, that the word, it, it comes to life when your spirit um, energizes it and, and, and makes it real to us, Lord God. So we just pray that you speak to us through your word, Father, that, that, we, that we be blessed by you, Lord God, and that you give us guidance, you give us direction, Lord God, you give us answers to our questions, you, you give us exactly what we need, and above all, Lord God, you point us to Christ, Father God, you point us to Jesus, Lord, so that we would renew our, our faith in him, that we would renew our commitment to the Lord, and that we would speak out to others about Jesus, that we would, we would be a, a, a testimony, Lord God, and that we would Speak the gospel through our lives and through our experiences to others that they may come to know you. Father, we thank you for the harvest field that is out there, Lord God, that is ready, that is ripe, Father God. And we pray for laborers, Lord God, to go out and to speak your truth, to speak your gospel in this land, Father God. Because there are many who need you right now, Father God, and we are the ones with the message for them, Father. So we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Um, so today I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, preach this message. Um, those of you who were here on Wednesday, well, I don't know, to me, I, I think everybody always walks out with something different. Um, but a lot of what happened on Wednesday um, went into what, what this message is. And it's called Mighty Warriors, right? And, and I believe that the Lord is calling, uh, calling out an army, right? An army of warriors. And so... Um, let's uh, well, actually I have, I have this uh, short little presentation that I'm going to show here and the, the, the name of the presentation itself uh, it's just you know PowerPoint that I put together for this message usually when I do that it's titled the same as the message but the title of this uh, PowerPoint keep going keep going it's coming um, is um, blank Shaped hole. Blank shaped hole. That's the name of the PowerPoint. Um, should come up eventually. So blank shaped hole, the reason for that for that title, well you'll you'll see it as I go through this thing froze. Um, so like I don't know if it was a, a thing from uh, that that was like mostly popular in the eighties, but that's when I heard it a lot and there was the the, the when people would, would testify and and, and um, um, witness to others, they would talk about a God-shaped hole, right? And, then, and, you know, that's when I heard it a lot, back in the 80s, but that's when I was young. Um, and really, when I first was exposed to the things of the Lord. Um, so people would talk about a God-shaped hole. And so what they would say is they would start talking about how, how everybody has a God-shaped hole in their heart, right? How, how, how within our heart... Yeah, this thing isn't working. We'll see if it comes up. Um... But within our heart, there is a there is a, a a void, right? There's an emptiness, right? And, and it didn't literally mean like that it, that it's cut out to the shape of God, like like if there's a specific shape. But but the idea is that there is this emptiness that can only be filled by God, right? Only God could fill that, right? And I and I believe there's a lot of truth, and there's a lot of um, you know we could do a whole Bible study just on that, on how God fulfills us and how he's the only uh, fulfillment that we could have um and so so that was the message right that that, that, or that, that, well, that was the example that people would use that we all have this this emptiness right this this um this unfulfilled area of our heart right that we that we try to fill with other things, right? That we, we you know, that, and sometimes we, we find temporary relief to that emptiness through different things, right? Uh, for some, it could be, uh, well, it's always, it, all, it, it always boils down to sin, but to, to some people that means different things. What I mean by that is, is like, to some, it's like sin as in, you know, you, you fill it with, like, drugs, or you fill it with, like, you know, doing things that, that don't honor God, you know, you go out and, and, and you, you, you fill your life with, with these things um, to try to fill that void, right? And the more you try to fill it, because it's not meant for that, 
the more void you end up with, right? For it's a temporary thing, right? Um, but 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 it, it doesn't actually fill the void, right? And then and then the reason why I say that 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 it, that it's always sin, but but some people identify it differently is because you can also try to fill that with with accomplishments, with you know deciding you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna perform well at work. Right, or I'm gonna do get straight A's at school. I'm gonna I'm gonna do things to give myself value, right? And ultimately, it's still sin whenever we don't, you know, put God first and we try to fulfill ourselves by by accomplishing things, by by um, I call it by performing, right? Um, we we perform. Um, we try to perform great to to have that fulfillment within us. Right? But the Word of God says that, that only God des- deserves that place. Right? It's even one of, the, one of the, the Ten Commandments, right? that you should have no gods before Him. That you, that, well, actually, it's a couple of the Ten Commandments. It, it says you, you, can, you will not form a graven image. You will not make an image that will take the place of God. Right? Whenever we try to fill ourselves with something other than God, we're, we're, we're breaking that commandment. Right? We're creating something in the image of God and trying to fill our heart with that. Right? And so the Lord was showing me as I was preparing for this message that, that, that that's, a, that's a real thing. Right? There's not a scripture where you can go and say you know, about the God-shaped hole, right? but there is a, a void, there's an emptiness, there's a need for God that we have. And, and only God can fill it. Right? That's the, the important part. That's the key that we, we need to understand only God can, can satisfy every, every desire, every, every void that that whole creates, right? And so, so I mean, many, many here might be familiar with that, right, with the, with the expression or, or with what that means. Um, and that was even the point of what the Lord was showing me. The Lord was showing me that, that yes, you know, there is a God-shaped whole, and if you accept the Lord, if you accept Jesus... Right in the if the presentation had worked, which it didn't, it just it just blank. Um, but if it um, it has a cross, right, and Jesus is what fills that, right? Jesus is, is what fills that void. And so, just like there is a God shaped hole in your heart that hopefully you've accepted Him and He's filling that, there is a Stephen shaped void in the kingdom of God. There is an Anna-shaped void in the kingdom of God. There's a Nancy-shaped void in the kingdom of God that only you could fill. That's why it's called a blank-shaped hole, because it's a fill-in-your-name-shaped hole. There is a a hole in in the kingdom of God that only you can fill. There is a purpose, there is a thing that God wants to accomplish on this earth, and nobody could accomplish it the way that you could. Right? There are many people that can speak um, the, the gospel, that can preach, that can have um, you know, great, um, whether it's, it's speaking, whether it's you know, miracles, whether it's you know, things, whatever you consider a great minister to be, there, there are those things. But there are some things that, that the greatest minister could not do and only you could do. There are people that only you would be able to reach. And, and I do know that God always makes a way, that God finds ways to fill gaps. But there are things that are specifically meant for you to go out and do, right? But a lot of times we feel that we're not qualified. We feel that we're not good enough. We feel that we're not, like, why would God choose us, right? And, and, and that's what I want to address today. I want to address that, that like, why, why us? Why, you know, why would God pick me to glorify his name? He's God. What does he need me for? Right? But, the, but the Word of God uh, says that he does. The presentation didn't work, but that's basically what it was. Right? <laughs> at, the end, at the end of the presentation, there's a, a soldiers, but it's their silhouette. Right? And it's the army of God with needing the people to be filled in. Right? And that's, that's us. Right? We need to, to, to answer the call right? and to fill in that, that void that only you could fill. Right? And so... Um, Getting into the message itself, which the, the, the title of the message is called Mighty Warriors, right? And a lot of it is focused on, on uh, what the Bible describes as the mighty men of David, 
right? And we'll be talking about that a little bit. Um, so I'm going to start in, in First Chronicles uh, chapter 12. Let's see if everything else works on this. Thing. There it is. First Chronicles 12, verse 8. So there is a Stephen-shaped void that needs to be filled. And, and only you could fill it. Um, so in verse 8 of First Chronicles, chapter 12, um, it says, Some brave and experienced warriors from the tribe of Gad also defected to David while he was at the stronghold in the wilderness. It says, they were experts with both shield and spear, as fierce as lions and as swift as deer on the mountains. Right? And so it's, it's describing these warriors that David had, and they were mighty warriors. Right? And, and it describes them as fierce as lions, but also as swift as deers. Right? And, and, and there's, you know, some, some of us are, are, are lions and some of us are deer, right? but we're all needed. Right in the kingdom of God, we're all needed to do the things that God knows that we can do, and it's not something that He puts upon us as a task that we need to figure out how to do. But it's something that He has created us for. That unless we 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 answer the call and do it, we'll never be completely fulfilled. We'll never completely know what we're capable of, what God can do through our lives. It's not a pressure like you need to do more. It's a, you get to be all that God made you to be. And so one of the things, so I shared this scripture on, on, um, on Wednesday, and, and I shared it because I had just heard it at a prayer meeting, right? And, and, and this was the context of the prayer that we were doing, right? And so, but I shared it here um, during the, the, the service, and then afterwards, I went home and the Lord like reminded me of this scripture, and, and I actually pictured this here. And, and, and where it says some brave and experienced warriors, I feel like he grabbed the word experienced. And I don't know if you guys have seen like in certain like science fiction movies or like I know in the, in the Avengers they do it, but like they grab, like in, they have the like, computers that are like, this, instead of having a screen, it's like out here and they grab it and they, you know, they blow it up and then they, they expound on whatever they're, I, like the Lord did that. He grabbed the word experienced and he blew it up and he just started to show me all these things about all these experiences that we have, right? Because these were warriors, and I do apologize, some translations don't use the word experience, but I'm just uh, showing, uh, explaining the revelation that the Lord showed me, um, that experience is, is a, I mean, there's training, there's studying, there's learning, there's practicing, there's a lot of ways of becoming skilled at, at, at fighting, right? Skilled at, at being a warrior, but here it specifically says experienced, which is different, right? Training is one thing. Learning is another thing. And if you've, if, especially if you're, you're, um, if you're older or not, not uh, if you're not like right out of, out of college or right out of high school, you may have experienced where somebody who comes out who has all the knowledge, has all the, the training, but they've never experienced whatever it is that you do. Right? They've never actually, you know, they don't have that experience. And so they, there's like really, they, they make sometimes really dumb mistakes or, or they, they oversee things that, that because of your experience, you know better, right? Because you've already been through it, you know, okay, wait, wait, you don't do it that way. Yeah, I know the textbook says this. I know that the professor told you this, but the reality is, you know, you have to do it this way. Or if something goes wrong in what they're doing, like they don't know what to do. Because it, all they know is, well, this, this is the way it's supposed to happen. But then because you have gone through, through that experience, because you had that moment where you're doing whatever it is, right? Whatever you do, right? You're, you had your, 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 your moment where, where you failed or where it didn't turn out the way you wanted it to turn out. And you, you experienced that. And at the time, you saw it as a failure. You saw it as a weakness. You saw it as, a, oh, no, I messed up. And God didn't see it that way. As you were going through it, God was saying, okay, they're going to learn from this. Okay, they're going to get stronger because of this. You saw it as a weakness. God saw it as a strength, right? And so 
These experienced warriors, they were, they were, they had been through things. They had experienced battles, right? Many of us have, have experienced, or I could say all of us have experienced battles against the enemy. We've experienced it in different ways, right? And, and, and they're real battles. And I'll, and I'll just be real honest with you. The Lord was really specifically targeting in, in what, what, the way he was showing me and what he was blowing all that up about the experiences. He was targeting um, emotional battles that people have faced, right? And, and, and again, a lot of times we go through it, right? We go through depression, right? We go through, you know, anxiety, right? We go through thoughts of, of, of ending our life, right? And, and the Lord was, was, was telling me, he goes, you could ask, you know, not don't answer, right? But just in your head, like, like how many of you have either have in your own life or, or someone in your household or in your family have experienced depression or wanting to, to end their life, right? Or, or, or uh, anxiety, right? And it, it's, it's everywhere, right? And, and we've had these battles, right? We, we, and we feel like those battles have taken its toll on us and that now we're, we're less because of it. But the Word of God says that, no, that we're more because we've overcome, because you're here now, because you've made it through, because you came out to the other end. And there are some right now that are in the middle of the battle, they're in the middle of the struggle, and they don't know Jesus, and they don't know the answer, and they don't know how to get through to the other end. And they need you to be there for them. It might be to speak to them and to lead them. It might be to pray for them, right? It might be just to smile, just to give them an encouraging word, just to say, hey, you're not alone, right? Some people might be surrounded by love and by support and feel like they're completely alone. And, and the Lord allows us, because we've experienced it, to be able to go and to help them through it, right? And to point them to Christ. You're not their Savior. You're not their answer. But you can point them to the Savior. You can lead them to the answer, right? And so these men that came to David, they were experienced. They had had these defeats. They had had these struggles. They had had these experiences that didn't seem like victories at the time. But now that they came to fight with David, now they were, they were victorious men. It says that they were, they were experts. They were experts because of their experience with the shield and the spear. And they were fierce as lions, but they were swift as deer. Right? And so... So these men were, were mighty. They were, they were, and, and I'll go into um, like who they were specifically, right? If, if we go to 2 Samuel chapter 23. These aren't just like random people. Like these are actual people. Like they're, they're, these are men with names, right? Um, 2 Samuel chapter 23. I'm going, to read, I'm going to read quite a bit. If you, if you have your Bible, you can follow along. I'm going to read from 8 to 24, um, or you can follow along up here. 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 8, and I'm reading out of the New Living Translation. It says, These are the names of David's mightiest warriors. Right? And it's not so much to focus on the name, but what they did. It's going to go over what they did. It says, The first was Jashobim. The Hakmonite, who was the leader of the three, the three mightiest warriors amongst, among David's men. He once used his spear to kill 800 enemy warriors in a single battle. Right? So he alone, or I mean, he took out 800 of the enemy warriors in one battle. Next in rank among the three was, was Eleazar, right? son of Dodai, a descendant of Aoa, and, and forgive me for butchering all the names, but it's not about the names. Uh, once Eliasad and David stood together against the Philistines, when the entire Israelite army had fled, he killed Philistines until his hand was too tired to lift his sword. And the Lord gave him a great victory that day. The rest of the army did not return until it was time to collect the plunder. And so he alone, uh, with David's help, um, De- defeated an entire army. Next in rank was Shama, son of Agi, from Harar, something like that. One time, 
the Philistines gathered at, at Lehi, Lehi, or Lehi and attacked the Israelites in a field of lentils. The Israelite army fled, but Shammah held his ground in the middle of the field. Everyone else ran away, but he held his ground in the middle of the field and he beat back the Philistines. So the Lord brought about a great victory through this one man. Once during the harvest, when David was at the cave of, Ad, of, of Adullam, the Philistine army was camped in the valley of Rephaim. The three who were among the thirty, an elite group among David's fighting men, went down to meet him there. David was staying in the stronghold, right? That's that cave of Adullam. He was staying in that stronghold at the time, and the Philistine detachment had occupied the town of Bethlehem. David remarked longingly to his men, Oh, how I would love some of the good water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem. So the three broke through the Philistine lines. They drew some water from the well by the gate in Bethlehem, and they brought it back to David. But he refused to drink it. Instead, he poured it out as an offering to the Lord. The Lord forbid that I should drink this, he exclaimed. This water is as precious as the blood of these men who risked their lives to bring it to me. So David did not drink it. These are examples of the exploits of the three. And then it goes, it goes on, right? These are the three mighty warriors under David that were like the living legends, right? And then so in verse 18, it goes into the 30 mighty men. Abishai, son of Zeruiah, the brother of Joab, was the leader of the 30. He once used his spear to kill 300 enemy warriors in a single battle. It was by such feats that he became as famous as the three. Abishai was the most famous of the 30 and was their commander, though he was not one of the three. There was also Benaniah, son of Jehodiah, a valiant warrior from Kabzeel. He did many heroic deeds, which included killing two champions of Moab. Another time, on a snowy day, he chased a lion down into a pit and killed it. Once, armed with only a club, he killed an, an imposing Egyptian warrior who was armed with a spear. Benaniah wrenched the spear from the Egyptian's hand, and he killed him with it. Deeds like these made Benaniah as famous as the three mightiest warriors. He was more honored than the other members of the thirty, though he was not one of the three. And David made him captain of his bodyguard. Other members of the, of, the, of the 30 included, and it goes through the names. I'm not going to go through all the names. But I just wanted to, to give a picture, right, of these warriors and how they were like the, the top warriors. I mean, like one person could defeat hundreds, right? They were so skilled and they were so trained. They were so experienced and they were able to do incredible things that that one regular person would not have been able to do but these were men that were empowered by God to go out and do his will right and so so the the thing about this army is that this army was created through hard times this army was created through times of defeat um and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna go through it there, there's a lot that I could read I'm gonna try to to to, to um Kind of, kind of give a summary, right? But in um, in First Samuel, it, it explains how this army came together, right? It, it explains um, where they formed together, and, and it explains it a little bit in in First Chronicles, where it says where, where they came to David, right? Um, these men they came to David when he was in that cave that it mentioned earlier in this in this verse, where the the cave of Adullam. Right? The cave of Adullam was, was a, a place of, of retreat. It was a place where David ran away from, from Saul and from you know, things that were going on in his life. He ran away to hide because he was so scared. Like he was like at the end of... Uh, and you know, David is like a, a great king. Right? David, you know, you know, we know he wasn't perfect, but we know he, he did you know, incredible things. Right, he's a, a, a historic figure, but he went through times of struggle. He went through times of difficulty, and so I want to I want to give a picture of that. Right, so keep in mind the mighty warriors. Right, but but their origins were during David's lowest, one of his lowest times. David had a lot of low times, um, but one of his lowest, lowest times, and, and especially in his younger years. Um, 
Let's go to 1 Samuel. There's several chapters that I'm going to go over, but I'm going to try to do it um, without reading through the whole thing. So we're going to go from chapter 18 to chapter 21. Um, 1 Samuel. First Samuel 18. I'm going to jump around, right, for the sake of time. Um, 1 Samuel 18.6. This is where David was when he uh, when he formed this great army of men that did incredible things. It's First Samuel eighteen. There you go. I'm going to read. Um, you can follow along up here if you like, or you can jump around with me. I'm going to read six through nine. Right. It says when the victorious Israelite army. Okay, so let me just give a little. Backstory is this is after David defeats Goliath, right? David is called as a young boy and anointed to be king, and then he, you know, his brothers go off to war, and then there's the whole story of, of Goliath, and I'm not going to go over all that, but we should be familiar with that. And so David becomes recognized, right, as a warrior, as somebody who can defeat a giant, right? And so this is after that, right, when David starts to, to, uh, be a part of the army, be part of battles, be part of, of these wars, right? And so that's where we're at and what we're reading. And, and again, this is going to be a, like a summary. I'm going to leave out a lot, but just to give a general idea. In verse 6, says, When the victorious Israelite army had re- was returning home after David had killed the Philistine, women from all of the towns of Israel came out to meet King Saul. They sang and danced uh, for joy with tambourines and cymbals. This was their song. Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. This made Saul very angry. What's this, he said? They credit David with ten thousand and me with only thousands? Next, they'll be making him their king. So from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. And I'll jump down to verse 28 of the same chapter. Right. So, so this is where, where, where Saul starts to become jealous of David after David was doing so well. Things were going so well for him. His future was bright. And this is where things start to get a little dark. Verse 28 says, When Saul realized that the Lord was with David and how much his daughter Michal loved him, Saul became even more afraid of him. And he remained David's enemy for the rest of his life. And then we'll jump down to chapter 19. Jump over to chapter 19, verse 8. 8 through 10. It says, War broke out again after that, and David led his troops against the Philistines. He attacked them with such fury that they all ran away. But one day when Saul was sitting at home with spear in hand, the tormenting spirits from the Lord suddenly came upon him. As David played his harp, Saul hurled his spear at David. But David dodged out of the way, and leaving the spear stuck in the wall, he fled and escaped into the night. Right, And so now Saul is not just jealous, but he is literally attacking David. And he throws a spear at him, and David dodges it. Right, He gets out of the way, and it goes right into the wall. And then we jump to the next chapter, chapter 20. Right? So this is just painting the picture of what David was going through. He was a victorious, and he starts to experience these things. And he hasn't done anything wrong at this time. But the jealousy of Saul is burning him. Right, It's burning inside of him, and it's causing him to hate David. So in, in uh, chapter 20, verse 1, it says, David now fled from Naoth in Ramah and found Jonathan. Right, Jonathan is Saul's son. What have I done, he exclaimed. What is my crime? How have I offended your father that he is so determined to kill me? That's, and then Jonathan says, that's not true, Jonathan protested. You're not going to die. He always tells me everything he's going to do, even the little things. I know my father wouldn't hide something like this from me. It just isn't so. Right? And, and then they go on arguing. David saying that Saul is after him, and Jonathan saying, no, that's crazy. He's not after you. He loves you, right? And then we jump down to verse 12. 12, it says, 
Then Jonathan told David, I promise by the Lord, I promise by the Lord, the God of Israel, that by this time tomorrow or the next day at, at the latest, I will talk to my father and let you know at once how he feels about you. If he, speaks, if, he, if he speaks favorably about you, I will let you know. But if he is angry and he wants to kill you, may the Lord strike me and even kill me if I don't warn you so you can escape and live. May the Lord be with you as he used, as he used to be with my father. And may you treat me with, with the faithful love of the Lord as long as I live. Right? And then jumping to um, then verse 16. So Jonathan made a solemn pact with David, saying, May the Lord destroy all your enemies. And then jumping down to 30. I'm trying to hit all the, the, the main points to make sure we, we get the picture of what's happening. So in verse 30, he says... Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan, right? After all this that happened between Jonathan and David. Saul boiled with rage at Jonathan. You stupid son of a whore. He swore at him. Do you think I don't know that you want to make him to be king in your place? Shaming yourself and your mother? As long as that son of Jesse is alive, you'll never be king. Now go and get him so I can kill him. But why should I be put to death? Why should he be put to death? Jonathan asked his father. What has he done? Then Saul hurled his spear at Jonathan, at his own son, intending to kill him. So at last, Jonathan realized that his father was really determined to kill David. Right? So, so, so he sees right, that, that, that David wasn't imagining it. Right? And David hasn't done anything wrong. He's only done what he's been asked to do. Right? And so we jump to chapter 21. Verse 10. It says, So David escaped from Saul, and he went to King Achish of Gath. But the officers of Achish were unhappy about his being there. Isn't this David, the king of the land? They asked. Isn't he the one that people honor with dances, seeing Saul has killed his thousands and David his ten thousands? David heard these comments and was very afraid of what King Achish of Gath might do to him. So he pretended to be insane, scratching on doors and drooling down his beard. Finally, King Achish said to his men, Must you bring me a madman? We already have enough of them around here. Why should I let someone like this be my guest? Right? And so David, and this is right before this army starts to form. Right? So David was a mighty man, had, had, had done incredible things. Right? But then because of his victories, he starts to, to, um, to, to get Saul, or Saul starts to get jealous. Right? He starts to hate David. And it gets to the point where things get so bad for David that he pretends to be crazy. He pretends that, 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 you know, that he's a madman. Um, you know, I, I, I can relate. <laughs> I can relate to this. Um, not that I was a great warrior, <laughs> but but I pretended to be crazy. Because um, when I was, you know, so so I don't know, you know, if, if, if everyone knows, but I, I never graduated high school. I, 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 well, I say I got kicked out of high school. Um, they they pulled me into the office and told me that uh, there was no way that I was going to graduate and that uh, I should just get out of school and go uh, get my GED and you know, go on with my life. Um, so I call that kicked out. But they, they, they it, there was, it's a, I, I got in a lot of trouble, right? One of the times that I got in trouble in school, this was right before that, I was 17 years old, and, um, you know, I didn't, I wasn't serving the Lord, and so, um, you know, I, I, I struggled with addiction, right? And so one time I was, I was under the influence at school, and they rec the teacher recognized it, and so they right away they sent me to the office and they called the police, right? And they actually came and they took me. Right? I was 17 years old. Um, if you guys know, uh, some of you have known me since back then, but if you guys know me or my brothers, uh, we look very young, you know, back then, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> when we were kids. And so, so at, at 17, I looked like 14. Right, I look I look really young, but but legally, I was an adult as far as 
when I got arrested, they didn't take me to juvenile. They took me to, to jail, to the adult jail with the adults, right? And they put me in with, in, a, in a cell that was uh, that had a lot of people, and it. it wasn't like a small cell for an individual. It was a, a tank, right? They, they, and they put me in there, and there were several people there, and I'd never been to jail before. I'd never even been to juvenile. Um, and so I remember being there, and I was under the influence, but I was terrified. Like, I didn't know what was going to happen. You know, you, you see movies, right? And you hear about prison and you hear about all these things. And so I'm there. And so I just start laughing, right? Because I didn't know what else to do, right? So I just start, if these people think I'm psycho, they're going to leave me alone, right? So that's what I did. I just, you know, started laughing and, and, you know, just acting crazy. I hadn't read this chapter yet, but, you know, I was being biblical. Um, and so, so I was so, I was in, in a point of my life where, being crazy was the answer for my situation, right? For my current circumstance. And at that time, when I was going through that, it was one of the low parts of my life, right? And I never thought that God would be able to get somebody like that, somebody on drugs, somebody getting arrested at school, eventually got kicked out of school or told to leave school, and to be able to use them in any way, for God's glory, right? That that was my experience, right? And so, so this is what David's going through. Like David's drooling on his own beard and scratching the walls and just acting crazy, right? So that this king will let him go, right? And so the king lets him go. And then so, so from here, from that point, that, that emotional state that David's in, um, in chapter 20, in, um, 22, this is where, where the subtitle of it is David at the Cave, cave of, of Adullam or Adullam or they, people, people pronounce it different. It says, so David left Gath and he escaped to the Cave of Adullam, of Adullam or whatever it's called. Soon his brothers and all his other relatives joined him there. Then others began coming. Men who were in trouble or in debt or who were just discontented until David was the captain of about 400 men. Later, David went to Mizpah and Moab where he asked the king, please allow my father and mother to live here with you because even his parents came to him. Until I know that God is going, until I know what God is going to do for me. So David was waiting on God to hear instructions from God. So David's parents stayed in Moab with the king during this entire time. David was living in this stronghold. He was in that cave of hiding this cave of defeat, but this cave where David was waiting and listening for the voice of God. One day the prophet Gad told David, leave the stronghold and return to the land of Judah. So David went to the forest of Herod. And then, and then I'm not going to read the rest, but it goes on, and it's not an overnight change, but this is where things change for David. And from going, from running and pretending to be a crazy person, he listened to the voice of the Lord. And then the Lord said, come out of the cave. The Lord said, come out of where you are. Come out of that place of depression. Come out of that place of, 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 wanting, your, you know, of, of, of wanting to act crazy just to, to, to be able to, to be let go. Right? God calls him out of that. Right? But while he was there, David formed this army of men. These same men that did all these great things that we just talked about, right? Or that we just read about. And um, just to, 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 to... So this part of Scripture doesn't give a lot of details of what David did while he was there in the cave, right? But we know that this army was, was developed there. But if we go to Psalm 142. Psalm 142... It gives us a, a little bit of insight. In Psalm 142. Oh, wait, I didn't have it here. Psalm. I'm getting there. It's in Psalm uh, 142. I'm going to read the whole thing. It's not that long. <clears throat> And so it starts off saying, a psalm of David regarding his experience in the cave. Right? So this is what David wrote about while he was there in the cave. This is what David was experiencing 
there. As people are coming, as he's building this army, but his feelings, his emotions are laid out in this psalm. It says, I cry out to the Lord. I plead for the Lord's mercy. I pour out my complaints before him and tell him all of my troubles. Look, this is a part, this is a point that a lot of people need to get to before the Lord. One of the things that I learned in my experience, because like I said, I was, I was, you know, lost. Right? I, I was pretending to be crazy just to get through my circumstance. Right? And I remember I got to this point, and, 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 and I had already heard of the gospel. I had already had my experience, you know, with the Lord before that. Right? But I had strayed from the Lord. But what I hadn't learned yet is I hadn't learned that God was somebody that I could bring my complaints to. That God, I hadn't learned to know the God that I can cry out to. I didn't know that, that I, could, I could, you know, just pour out my heart. And, and look, my heart was dirty. My heart was ugly. My, my prayers didn't come out, oh Lord, thou God of heaven and earth. My, my prayers were, were not pretty. Like I wouldn't repeat the words that I used. Like, I don't even talk like that anymore, you know, ever. But, but that's how I poured out my heart to God. You know, and, and, and I know it sounds like crazy, like, like, you know, why are you telling people to do that? I had to get to that point where I was just like, you know what, God, I'm not going to play any more games. I'm not going to pretend to be something I'm not. I'm not going to try to fit this mold that, that I see out there, that I see, you know, these perfect Christians and what they're supposed to be like. You know, and I just poured out my heart to God and, and told Him exactly what I was going through. And I, and I went through this, this knowing God in an intimate way and not as, a, as, as somebody who I had to meet up to a certain standard in order to approach Him. Right? And so David is saying that he's crying out, he's complaining to God. Right? And he's telling Him all of his troubles. I invite you to, to come to God and to tell Him all of your troubles. In verse 3 it says, When I am overwhelmed, you alone know the way that I should turn. Wherever I go, my enemies have set traps for me. I look for someone to come and help me, but no one gives me a passing thought. No one will help me. No one cares a bit of what happens to me. See, David is saying this while he's in the cave. His family came to him. There's people from all over that are coming to support him. But him, in his circumstance, feels like nobody is for him. He feels so alone. Like if, he's, like if everybody has turned his back and nobody cares. And they're right there with him. But in his condition, he doesn't see that. He doesn't see the love. He doesn't see the support. All he sees is that he's alone. That he's defeated. But, but what David had to his favor is that he knew he could call out to God. Call out to God, I, I, I encourage you. Then I pray to you, O Lord. I say, you are my place of refuge. You are all I really want in life. David realized that void that he had, that only God could fill it. Hear my cry, for I am very low. Rescue me from my persecutors, for they are too strong for me. Bring me out of prison, so I can thank you. The godly will crowd around me, for you are good to me. Right, And so David, in the midst of this time, finds hope. He finds this way of being able to think, you know, if anybody can get me out of this, it's God. Right. And so he cries out, and, and, and so he, he realizes that God is for him. Right? If there's no one else for him, God is for him. Right? And, and again, he did have support. He did have his family. He did have all these things, but he could not see it. Because he was so caught up in the lies of the enemy. Right? And the devil does that. The devil tells you, hey, what you're going through, nobody's ever gone through that. You're all alone. Nobody understands. You know, when, when you get better, maybe then you can go to God. Right? When you recover from that, maybe you can approach God. Maybe you can be used by God. But right now, you're broken. Right now, you're, you're, you're damaged goods. Right now, you don't have what it takes to be anything for God. That's what the devil says. And they're all lies. They're 100% lies. But when we, when we listen to it, 
when we entertain those thoughts, our blessings, the things that we have, they start to fade away. We, we, we lose sight of what God has that He can help us with, of the, the very things that are going to help us to get through this time. Fortunately, you know, um, well, I know for me, I had people who loved me. I had people who, even though I didn't know, even though I didn't acknowledge, even though I didn't value them at the time, they didn't let up. Right? My mother, my sister, my brothers, even though they were little, I never forget, you know, when Stephen went to go visit me at jail. You know, I came and, you know, I, I was, and I was happy to see them because I was, I, this, is, this is not that, that, that time when I was 17, this is when I was older, and I was in jail, and I was there for, for a month, right, and so I was in there in, in, the, in the prison clothes, and, and well, I think it was through a, 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 this wired barrier where I was able to see him, and I was happy to see him. But but it it, it it hurt him like he, he to see me behind bars it, it, it was it was a traumatic experience for him and and he didn't want to come back after that right but I remember getting to that point of my life where where like even my brothers were there for me right it was hard for them because whenever we struggle it's not just us right it's everybody around us that struggles and so so I had my brothers. I had my family, I had that, and every, and, but I, I didn't value it, right? I didn't appreciate it, right? And so, so I, you know, I, I, I struggled through that until I was able to come to the feet of the Lord. And, and I was in a, at that point, I went from jail, and then I went to rehab, and then while I was in rehab is where the Lord spoke to me. And it was after a, 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 my own traumatic experience where I was there, I was in the, in the place, right, it was, a, it was a program, and they were showing us videos, right, of, 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 of homes that have a, of addicts, you know, or alcoholics in them, right, how it affects everybody in the family, not just the person who's going through it, right, and how the, 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 the struggle is not just that person alone, right, it affects everybody. I remember I was watching this, and it just, it cut to my heart, and I remember I just started crying, and I hadn't cried in years at that point. I hadn't cried, you know, I was, I was already in my 20s. And I hadn't cried all my adult life. And, and, and I was crying and crying and crying. And I couldn't stop. I remember I got to the point where I thought I had actually gone crazy because I couldn't stop crying. I, three hours had gone by and I was still crying. And I'm not crying. I don't mean like, you know, just tears coming down. I mean, I was crying. I was yelling out. I was, there was people trying to comfort me. There was counselors. There was like, it was like crazy. And, and I thought I had lost my mind. I thought I had completely lost it. And I, and I cried for, for hours. And then, I, and then I finally stopped crying. Right? And it was already nighttime. And then I went to bed. And when I, when I stopped crying, then that's when things got really clear for me. That's when I was able to, to, to know that God was calling me. Right? And I remember I was in that, in that rehab home. It was, like a, it was like a jail cell with bunks. And I remember I got on the floor and I just asked God, you know what, God, I don't know what else to do. Every single decision I've made, everything that I try to do for myself, even if I try, even if I'm trying to do good, it goes, it goes wrong. And so I, I, I asked God to change me, to just, you know, to just take me the way I was and to, to do what he could in my life. And since that day, I've never turned back, right? I was able to, 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 to you know, I, I rededicated my life to the Lord, right? And he was able to get me through that experience. I still went through, through a year of therapy, right? I went through therapy. I went through counselors. I went through a lot of, a lot of things. There was still a, a, way, a, a ways to work, but that was the turning point, right? And then, and then from there... You know, came came out of rehab, went back to college. You know, I got kicked out of high school. You know, ended up uh, getting my GED, going back to college, and then and then being able to, to you know just move up from there and, and and then get into ministry and to be used by God. My my my, my the reason why I explain all that is because I wanna I wanna show that you know I don't want to give glory to the devil and all the stuff that I that I struggled through. The glory goes to God. And all the stuff that he's been able to do through my life. And it's not because I learned and because I was good enough and because I, I became good enough. It's because I became surrendered. 
is because I became surrendered. And today, the reason why I'm able to, to, to have hope for the future is not because, well, I've already gone this far, but it's because I continue to become surrendered. And that's what God requires of us, to be surrendered. And when we do that, then we start to fill this gap. Then we start to fill that U-shaped hole in the kingdom of God when we surrender to Him and just trust Him. Right? That's what God calls us out to do. Um, let's go uh, to First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter 5 verse 8. It says in verse 8, it says, Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion. Looking for someone to devour. And so we need to recognize that we have a common enemy. Right? That we all have an enemy. Right? And he's the devil. Right? And, and, and I say he's a common enemy because we have all struggled through things. You know, and even now, like, you know, uh, like I said, we, we, we had prayer on Wednesday and different requests came up. Uh, you know, we prayed for different people from here um, or family members of, of here. People going through all kinds of things, going through cancer going through depression, going through, um, you know, financial troubles, you know, just all kinds of, of things that people are going through. And the thing that we need to understand is it's the same devil behind every single one of those things. It's the same devil that's trying to convince you that God's not there for you as the, as the devil that's telling your neighbor, right, that they're not going to live through their experience. It's the same devil. Right? And it's the same devil that you've had victories over. It's the same devil where you've, your experiences from the past, you've been able to go, come through them and be victorious. Even though at the time it felt like a defeat, you've been able to come through it. And that's a defeat to the devil. It's that same devil that we're all fighting against. Right? And so that's why we need to be together. We need to be you know, united, be there for each other. The thing I liked about that image that I had put up about the soldiers, there was a silhouette of soldiers, is that it was, they were together. It was a troop, right? And so every soldier depended on the other soldiers, right? And so God calls us out because we need it, but also because there's others who need it, right? There's others who need for us to answer that call, right? So God is calling us out. I just got a couple of scriptures to, to close off. Um, go real, quick, real quickly to John 16 so we all have an enemy there is a devil who is out to, to lie to us out to tell us that we're alone out to tell us that nobody cares that nobody loves us that there is no hope for us that we're never going to get past this that we're always going to be struggling that we're always going to be suffering and they're all 100% lies there is a God of hope there is a God who has plans for us. There is a God who knows that there is more to, to our life and there is more that, 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 um, that we have to offer than what we see. In verse, in, um, sorry, John 16, uh, And it's in red because Jesus is talking, right? <clears throat> Jesus is talking. He says, I have told you all this so that you may have peace. In me, right? So that you may have peace in Jesus. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Right? And this doesn't mean Jesus against the world. It means every single circumstance that you face, Jesus has overcome that. Every single fear, every single struggle, Jesus has overcome it. Right? And, and our job is to be in faith. Right? To be in faith and believe right? that there is, light, that there is a light at the, at the, other, at, at the, at the other end of the tunnel. Right? And, and so Jesus saying that he already defeated all that. Um, and then uh, the last scripture is in Isaiah 13. I believe this is a, 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 a timely word. I believe it's, it's a word 
that's relevant to our time um, and that God is, is calling out an army that God is is wanting to to move his people forward right in Isaiah uh, chapter 13 verse 1. Isaiah 13, 1 through 4, it says, Isaiah, son of Amos, received this message concerning the destruction of Babylon. Verse 2 says, Raise a signal flag on a bare hilltop. Call up an army against Babylon. Wave your hand to encourage them as they march into the places of the high and mighty. I, the Lord, have dedicated these soldiers for this task. Yes, I have called mighty warriors to express my anger, and they will rejoice when I am exalted. Hear the noise on the mountains. Listen as the vast armies march. It is the noise and the shouting of many nations. The Lord of heaven's armies has called this army together. And I believe that God is calling us at this time because there are a lot of things that are going on in our country, in the world around us, there are things that are happening that if the church doesn't rise up, if the church doesn't start praying, doesn't start going out and, and, and talking about Jesus, if the, if the church doesn't start being active in, in our communities, that, that we're going to get run over. Right? The enemy's going to have his way. Right? And in a lot of places he is. The thing that kind of messes us up is that we look to certain organizations or we look to certain types of people or we look to certain groups that, are, that we feel like they're messing things up or they're the ones that are causing you know, whatever, right? We, we, we look at people and we target the people, not understanding that there is a devil behind it, right? There is a devil behind the things that, that are happening in the world. Right? And that's why sometimes it seems, I think I said this uh, on Sunday before, that it seems like, like, the, the, you know, like the credit card companies are together with the banks and together with the government and together with all. Like, like it seems like there's this huge organization of things that are trying to take over the world. And I'm not saying that, that there isn't um, like people or even companies or whatever that, that are out to do bad. But what I'm saying is that, is that it, there aren't individuals that we're up against. There aren't these people that we need to defeat. It's a devil. There is a devil and his demons, and they are organizing things in the world to come against the church, to come against the things of God, to come against you. Right? And we need to stand up as a church. We need to stand up in prayer. We need to stand up, you know, reading the word, knowing that, that the answer is God. Right? And when we do that, then it makes us come together. Right? When, when, when we're trying to fight you know, all these different organizations, we're all separate. But when we realize that we have one common enemy and we have one common solution, then we come together as a people and we're able to have victory. Right? We're able to defeat the devil. Right? So that's my, my, I believe God is calling us out. He's calling us out from our circumstance. I know sometimes you feel defeated. I know sometimes you feel like your struggle has taken more out of you. But God uses that as a strength, right? And God says that you are a blessing to others, right? Let me go ahead and close this in prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord God. I thank you for your your words of encouragement, Father. I thank you, Lord God, that we are not damaged goods, Father. That we are not broken or defeated. Lord God, even if we've experienced, even if if we've had you know, a part amputated, or even if, if, we, if we, we are physically not where we used to be, Lord God, in you, Lord God, we are stronger. In you, Lord God, we are victorious. Father, we don't stand in our own experience, but we stand on Christ Jesus and on the victory that he had on the cross. We stand on that, Lord God, fully trusting you, Lord God, and we say that if you tell us to go, we'll go. Lord God, if you call us out to go and and, and whether it's to, to, to be active in, in certain organizations or in certain areas, to go and, and vote when we need to go vote, to pray for our leaders, to pray for our nation, the, the, that we're going to stand up and we're going to be heard. 
Father God, and we're not just going to be quiet, and we're not going to let the devil to continue to lie to us, Lord God, but we're going to stand on your word, Father. We thank you that you call us out because you believe in us, Lord God. So we believe in you, Father. Father, I just pray a blessing over every person here, Lord God, whether they are going through a struggle themselves, or somebody in their home, or somebody in their family, Lord God, I pray that you would heal them, that you would bless them, that you would resolve the issue, Father God. So Father, because I know that you want to bless your people so that we could be a blessing, Lord God. You want to have an army that's whole and complete, that doesn't have an emptiness, a void within, but that is filled with you, Father God. I just pray for your blessing on your people, Lord God. Bless them, Father. We thank you and we love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for the victory. Thank you, Lord God. We stand in the victory of Christ. Hallelujah. We pray in your holy name, Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's uh, have some worship. <laughs>